Good afternoon. This is Angela Hardin, General Manager of WHCR 90.3 FM, and I am once again introducing Barbara Askins. She is the host of 125th Street and Beyond. Barbara is President and CEO of the 125th Street Business Improvement District here in Harlem, better known as the 125 Bid. Barbara successfully created this bid and her public involvement strategies have led to successes such as the annual Harlem Holiday Lights and the first cultural bonus incentive in NYC to be used to shape the future of 125th Street as a cultural destination. She is currently working closely with the NYPD and 12 other city agencies to foster an interagency and community involvement approach to addressing crime, homelessness, mental illness, sanitation, and streetscape improvements. Take it away, Barbara. Thank you, Angela, and good afternoon, listeners. 125th Street and Beyond is a show about the work we are doing at the 125th Street Business Improvement District, better known as BID, here in Harlem. It is also a show about the relationships we are building with city agencies, with other BIDs in New York City and around the world, and our neighbors here in Harlem. We will be giving updates on what's happening and addressing issues that impact the 125th Street Commercial District. So what's new on 125th Street? Well, new businesses are coming in. Panda Express, an Asian restaurant between Adam Clayton Powell and Lenox Avenue, Malcolm X Boulevard, is doing a build out. Sanitation Department is giving us a little help. So there are DSNY labors. With through a company hired by the city, through a company hired by the city to help clean New York City. About six workers are uh, there in the bid boundaries, approximately three days a week in our area. There are store closings, unfortunately. We lost the Menace Collective. Um, they were located at 2090 in the Teresa Hotel. A new seafood place is coming soon to 66 West 125th Street. Party City closed about a month ago, but we have seen people coming and going, looking at the space. The Victoria Renaissance Hotel just completed the brickwork out front, and we are awaiting the opening of um, we are waiting the opening of the first full service hotel in Harlem. Repairs were being completed on the marquee. At Adam Clayton Powell and Lennox, Staples is relocating across the street to a new location from 105 to next to the Victoria Theater at 100 West 125th Street. The Urban League continues its new development at 121 West 125th Street. They've removed the scaffolding and they've done a new sidewalk pavement so we can see that the announcement for the National Civil Rights Museum should be coming soon. Day nice, opened the second store. Unfortunately, we lost Kids Are Us at, and they are having a big sale, going out of business, 24 days left. The National Black Theater continues its construction. So you can see there's a lot of movement taking place on 125th Street right now. Stores coming in, stores going out, development projects continuing to move forward, and our pedestrian footfall counts are now increasing. During the last week, we saw approximately 450,000 people in our district. But today, we are going to talk to a very special guest. Ms. Cassandra White, who is the Deputy Commissioner at the City of New York Department of Homeless Services. Because along with all the movement, we still have challenges. And we are happy to be working with Cassandra. She is responsible for, for providing oversight of operational activities, managing divisional programs. She represents the agencies with external governmental agencies, establishing executive and management control and providing executive leadership. But let's get right down to this. All of these responsibilities you put in the forefront of tackling one of the nation's greatest challenges, Cassandra homelessness. And many look at the numbers and call it a crisis situation. So, but before we dig deep into that, why don't we learn a little bit about you? Tell us, um, you know, what brought you to this work, you know, uh, and how you are interested and excited about doing things to help make our city better. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show, Barbara. I'm really excited to be here. And thank you for letting me be on this incredible platform, because I think it's important to spread awareness about our outreach efforts um, for the most vulnerable New Yorkers. The reality is that we have to do everything we can to keep the community informed about the work that we're doing and to ensure that we're keeping everyone safe. So we're excited to talk about the things that DHS is doing. I am, as you said, Cassandra White. I am the Deputy Commissioner for Street Homeless Solutions at the New York City Department of Homeless Services. I'm a lifelong New Yorker, born in Harlem Hospital, raised in Lincoln Projects. So I am, you know, very near and dear to 125th Street. I would ride the bus, uh, of course, because I went to junior high school 43. So get on the Fifth Avenue, ride across the Amsterdam Avenue. So 125th Street is a place that I'm very familiar with. And so when I heard about this project with City Hall and things were flagged, I absolutely jumped in because, you know, the reality is that as a lifelong New Yorker, you want New York to continue to thrive, to uh, be a welcoming place where people are comfortable, safe, and that our communities can continue to grow. Yet we want to make sure that we're also peeling back the layers and doing everything we can to address things as they come up. And so I think that's part of the reason why I came to DHS. Um, and I recently went from working with families with children to working with the street homeless population. And that act actually happened in 2020. So at the height of uh, COVID, literally I was appointed in January of 2020. And by March of 2020, we were in a, the, the midst of COVID. And so um, I think my lens has shifted, right? Because I think the world has changed after COVID, but the reality is that people are just as vulnerable. We're seeing just as much mental health uh, issues, just as much homelessness and other things plaguing our city that we have to roll up our sleeves and get to work on. And we do. And so let me just take you back to right after the pandemic, because and particularly with you being from Harlem, because you know Harlem was hit very hard with the COVID. And so those of us who were working here, we were so busy trying to stay afloat and uh, actually keep our offices together, how we're going to work, manage, keep our employees together. And then when everything started to pan out, we saw this huge amount of people out on the streets and no one knew where they came from, mm -hmm. a hot happened. And with you being from Harlem, you know, seeing 125th Street, just what were your thoughts? I mean, at that particular time, I didn't even know how to find you. We didn't know who to talk to. You know, it was just, you know, yeah. it was just a big task, but you understood this community. And when you saw it, you know, I just know you had to be appalled because it was really challenging. Yeah, I think the entire city shifted during COVID, right? There were already things happening, but post-COVID, Thing, during COVID, things became glaringly apparent, right? We were working really hard at DHS to try to keep the homeless population safe, the ones who were in shelters, as well as doubling down our efforts to keep people who are on the streets safe, right? And so I think the whole city was in a mode of, of, of trying to manage a crisis that was unprecedented, right? And I have to say, I believe that New York City did an amazing job considering everything that was happening. Um, but I can tell you, Barbara, that what we saw after COVID began to, you know, subside was that there were folks that are out who um, may have had issues prior to COVID, but once COVID was dying down, those issues began to just become more apparent and prevalent, right? And we saw the increase in, in people suffering from mental illness, the increase in people uh, with substance use disorder. So I think that COVID actually... Uh, brought to the forefront and may have even exasperated issues that were there and forced everyone to really rethink how we do this work and how we address these issues. And I can tell you the first time I came to 125th Street, I was a little shocked because growing up and riding the bus and even walking back and forth 125th Street, there's always been some issues there, but you never saw the widespread um, amount of folks around just doing things, right? Historically, I know growing up, we saw pockets. We know there'd be a pocket on St. Nicholas Avenue, maybe a pocket down by Lexington. But now what you see, and I think it's across the city, are more prevalent and a bigger prevalence of people with substance use disorder and mental illness that really need help and really need resources to move the needle and put them on a different trajectory. Well, that too. And, and also in the beginning, 
there was no coordinated effort. Mm -hmm. And so everybody was working hard, but not together. And Mm -hmm. I'll give you a great example of um, when an initiative was done in Times Square to help Times Square and, and teams of people were going out there. I don't know if it crossed anybody's mind, but all of a sudden, because you know, from down there in Midtown is only one or two stops to get to 125th Street. So we just had this influx of homelessness that just Mm -hmm. came out on 125th Street and mental illness. And at that point, we didn't even know how to identify. Mm -hmm. Uh, But what I can say, there were two agencies that stepped up right away when we formed the interagency collaboration, which brought all the agencies to meet with us on a weekly basis. That was NYPD and DHS. Mm -hmm. You know, DHS, you guys came together, you looked at the problem and came up with a team of people to come to 125th Street on a daily basis to engage people. And I know we're not going to get into numbers, but the engagement effort, can you just talk about that? Um, the work that the street teams you use to come and try to assist those who need help. So one thing we found about the homeless population in New York City, specifically the street homeless population, is that we've seen a shift in who makes up this population. This population is younger than we have seen historically. They're more transient than we've seen historically. Um, And so it feels like we had to do a couple of things. And I'm happy to say that under uh, Mayor Adams' administration, we've been given the resources to do so. So one of the things that changed uh, right at the beginning of covid was that historically street outreach for homeless folks was only done through contracted outreach providers, right? If you had a contract with the city and we have five, uh, one for each borough, then folks would call 311 and those are the people who went out to address street homeless uh, persons calls. After it began under de Blasio, but really expanded under Adams, which was the rapid response that DHS has been able to provide. And so we, added our own teams of outreach folks, right? And so that allowed us to be able to respond to you, uh, Ms. Askins, in a way that historically we probably would not have been able to. We could have asked our contracted outreach providers who are responsible for doing more of the rapport building and working with folks, but you wouldn't have that ability to be out there every day for a certain amount of hours with other city agencies doing this work in the immediate and then ensuring that we're coordinating with other city agencies. So I think the difference now is that the resources that have been put to this have been, you know, astronomical, right? The amount of low barrier housing that we've been able to open has been astronomical. And the most important thing, I think the most, the thing that I'm most proud of uh, since I've been in the seat is the level of coordination Um, that we've seen with other city agencies. I run something called the Coordinated Behavioral Health Task Force, where I bring in multiple agencies twice a week. Uh, We meet on Wednesdays and Thursdays. And what we do is that we actually have every city agency that is responsible for touching these folks that deal with mental illness and substance use on these calls. So we have state outreach teams, H&H, DOHMH, um, everyone, and we're saying, hey, what are we doing? How are we coordinating our resources? How do we help the most entrenched and most vulnerable? And how do we ensure that we get to the individuals that need our help and that we ensure that the people who can connect us to those individuals know who we are and what we have to offer? Yeah, I, and I think that's so important because that's that's exactly what we were doing at a local level more focused. Um, Mm -hmm. And I have to thank your agency and the Adams administration because you heard our cry because it was really overwhelming and too much for it to address as a, what we saw a cookie cutter program that was being handled. You know, I, I see every, every area is different and requires something different. And by that close coming together, and even I think you did some work with NYPD. So Mm -hmm. can you, touch on that with NYPD because you know at first everybody was blaming the police for everything (laughs) and then your coordination with them started making a difference. Mm -hmm. Yes we've been working with NYPD for quite some time but did not have the level of coordination in the 125th Street area that we've had in other areas and I think that that was key because the reality is that you know I know that there is a feeling of, you know, that law enforcement should not participate in homeless outreach, but the law enforcement partners that we have had have been completely 
supportive and cooperative and understand the population. They understand the needs and they work hand in hand with us and our contracted providers to support the, the individuals that we're engaging with. The reality is that there are some times that you do need law enforcement to step in and move the needle, but ultimately most of the time you don't. They're there to provide the support and to ensure that everyone is safe, not just the people doing the work, but the individuals on the street. Um, and so we have found that our partnership with NYPD has been amazing. They've been excellent partners. They rise to occasion, they're out there with us day in, day out. They're in the subways, MTA, PD, transit, and they're lockstep with us, understanding the population, understanding that this is a difficult, vulnerable group of individuals who require a different set of skills in a different lens and sometimes speaking to them 15 times in a three-day period, but they are our partners and they understand that and they roll up their sleeves and they lockstep with us. And we've had nothing but good experiences in that partnership. Yeah. And you brought up something that took me a while to understand. You say speaking to them 15 times, that's that engagement word. And yes. I kept trying to understand, what do you mean engagement? You, you had this many engagements. Well, what happens after engagement? I didn't understand the importance of the engagement and the repeated attention, you know, the uh, repeated outreach that you needed to do with individuals. And so your engagement activity is extremely high. And mm -hmm. um, sometimes people, you know, beat you up on, mm -hmm. um, you, well, why are you getting, why so many people still out there? Can you mm -hmm. just dig into that? Because I think I had to learn that it is a process. It mm -hmm. is a process for getting people help. And it would be good for our listeners to understand that too. When you see people out there, it doesn't mean that there isn't any work going on. Absolutely. I, and that's something I had to learn coming from the families with children side, running a path intakes into the Bronx. Families come to you for help. When you're engaging people on the street, they're not coming to you for help. You're going to them and saying, can I please help you? So right. it is a different, it's a different ball game. It is a different engagement. And guess what? The reality is that our services are voluntary. We can't force anyone to do anything, right? We do our best to first and foremost, try to build a rapport, right? And for DHS, the rapport building is minimal because we do rapid response. We do, hey, there's a situation. How do we go out and address it? Our contracted providers, they actually carry caseloads and they have, you know, have people that they are on their most vulnerable list. So they have a whole robust program that is built around rapport building for days, weeks, months, years. DHS does rapid response, but we also know there has to be rapport building and engagement in order to even do rapid response because people have to trust you and they have to trust that which you're going to take them to where you're going to refer them to is actually what they need right and that they're not being told something and getting something else right or that you're actually there to help them i can tell you prior to my coming to this role people there was a chronicity requirement and what happened was that you could even get into the shelter system as a street homeless person, not the regular shelter system through outreach, unless you were known by a contractor outreach team. You could go to 30th Street or a regular intake because the reality is that New York City has right to shelter, but you couldn't come into the low barrier beds, which is what we use for the most chronic street homeless individuals, unless you were known by a street outreach team. That is no longer the case. We want everyone to come into shelter, right? We don't care if you're known to the outreach teams or not. You don't have to prove to us that you're street homeless. If you say you're ready to come in, we're going to bring you in and bring you to the best place given your current situation. And that comes sometimes, like I said, Ms. Asking, would you speak to them one day and a person just became homeless, ran into you in a train, something happened, and you've been couch surfing and couch surfing didn't work out, now you're homeless. And we just seen you one day, we bring you in. But there are people we've seen for months, right? People we've seen for over a year or two, right? Who we've been speaking to you several times a week. And that 20th time, the person says, yes, I'll go inside, right? And even if they go inside, doesn't mean that they'll stay. The work happens once they get inside, right? Because then you're trying to make sure it's the best fit for them, right? Does this person need a specialized type of shelter? Are there substance use issues? Is there mental health issues, right? How do we not only get them in the door, but how do we keep them in the door and build them up so that they can get on a trajectory to permanent housing? Wow, that's that's the 
awful lot of work going on with each and every person. You have to do this for each and every person that you encounter. So yeah. what are some of the things, particularly for 125th Street, that you found are working? And and also, too, people in this community want to be helpful. And when they see things on the street, they want to know who to call, how can I help, how can I be of assistance? So, you know, if you can first tell us about, you know, things that you saw that worked that helped you to get people here on 125th Street into shelters, and then also a little a little bit of instructions for our listeners to uh, be able to help report what they see. Absolutely. So for us, um, the work that we've been doing at 125th Street, I think, was really important in that the first thing, like you said, was that connection with the law enforcement folks up there, right? Because we want to know who they are, who are they working with, where are they stationed at, how do we connect with them to broaden our our outreach efforts, right? We then also went to our DHS contracted outreach provider uh, for the Harlem area, I believe it's Mark, and so we automatically went to them, that's Manhattan Outreach Consortium, and said, hey, you know, we, we know that you guys are already in the area. Who are you working with? Who? What are the things that you're seeing? Because we need to all be on the same page as we expand this. We then went to H&H, &H, Health and Hospitals. Hey, you guys have Harlem Hospital, you have this, you have that, you have show vans. How can this be brought in to help us address what we're seeing here, deal with the shelter piece of it, the homelessness piece, but also the substance use, mental health piece. And then we went to deal with HMH. That is their specialty, right? The work with the substance use disorder and the mental health actual outreach work in the field where they're working with you on the ground to address those issues in real time. And so we said to all of our partners, let's all get on the same page. Let's do this together as a team. So we all see the same people and work right. with the same people, right? We don't want to have a duplication of services because I can tell you one thing about street homeless individuals. They don't like to be harassed and they don't want you speaking to them. Five different people ask them the same thing in one day. So let's coordinate. Right. Let's ensure that everybody understands everyone's role. And then let's make sure we work collaboratively and consistently because you have to be consistent, right? And seeing folks, you have to be collaborative and that, okay, you don't want shelter today, but you're saying that you would like to get your, you know, flu shot, right? Or you want to find out about the sore in your leg. Who can we refer you to? Is that health and hospitals at the show van? Is that a street medicine team through DHS? Is that a, another contract, right? So ensuring that we also had everyone to the table to bring the right resources when people need them because this population is transient, right? They will move around and, you know, if you can't get something to them at that moment, you don't know the next time you're going to be able to have that ability to connect, build a rapport right. and potentially move the needle. And so I think that collaboration with all of the agencies uh, worked wonders. And I can tell you, Ms. Askins, I think the fact that you created a space where everyone could come in and brainstorm and really get on the same page, right? And not work in silos, I think was important because what it did was it forced everyone into the room to identify what it is they could deliver on and then have everyone be responsible for the things under their purview. And I think that helped to just set the momentum to get everyone on board to move the needle with this population and to do what we need to do to bring 125th Street to where it should be and to help the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Exactly. And so tell people, well, thank you so much for that, because um, what, how we got to that point was I'm hearing everything that every different agency is hearing. And so we decided, no, 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 we have to all be in the same room so everybody can hear it. So if you say uh, what you think that DHS is supposed to be doing, DHS can respond to you and let you know whether it is this way or not that way. And then you can form a collaborative. It seems mm -hmm. like a simple thing, but it really has worked for us. And mm -hmm. where can people in the community who see things on 125th Street, who should they call? Because things are changing so much. Is it 311? Just how does that work? How do they get information to you? So 311 is the best way, right? 311 works in two ways. You have street homeless person street homeless conditions and you have homeless persons assistance street homeless conditions when you call 311 is what you say if you see something that is a condition so uh debris 
uh, a structure, right? Something that is a tangible item and you want it addressed, right? If someone has built some sort of a cardboard structure and they're blocking ingress and egress uh, to a business, right? Or if there's just a tremendous amount of debris and no one is there. Anything that is a structure or group of items that are attributable to potentially homeless folks, that is a street homeless condition. Street homeless person's assistance is when you want someone to come out and address an individual. And it can be both. You can have a condition with a person in it, right? But it's two different things if you want to address two separate issues. But the best way to do is to call 311, be really clear about what you're seeing. Because the first dispatch depends on what you say. If you say homeless person's assistance, that's going to come to DHS. And we're going to automatically within a certain, I think our average turnaround time is 14 minutes for us to get this out to our contractor outreach providers. So they are automatically notified and then they have to get out there by a certain amount of time and look for the person. If you say street homeless conditions, which is a structure, debris, or things like that, those go to NYPD first. NYPD then goes out to assess the situation. If they find that it is a condition and there are people there, they notify us. And this is happening in minutes. This doesn't take a lot of time. This is all in minutes. But NYPD goes out first. They then notify us if it is actually people there and we go out. If it is a condition, they then go back to the task force that is working now under Mayor Adams. And that's where all of the agencies responsible for cleaning up come into play. So that is DHS, who's there to offer services, if there are people there. That is sanitation, right? It could mm -hmm. be Department of Buildings. It could be, you know, if depending on the jurisdiction, if it is a CUNY site, right? We're going to notify right. whoever is responsible for the spot. So street homeless conditions is different than street homeless person assistance. But either way, call 311 and give them as much information as possible because the more information you give, the better the response will be. And one good thing about 311, we've heard people's concerns about, about feeling like they're not getting responses when they call 311. So we are currently under the mayor's uh, directive working to expand 311. That way when you call, you actually get an answer about your outcome. So it's not like you're just calling and you don't know what happened. We're going to actually be responding with answers. And that's going to be all of the city agencies working towards that. So you know, I called in about a homeless person, what happened? And you'll get a response. Person accepted assistance. Person did not accept assistance. So moving forward and hopefully in the next couple of months, I think by the fall, 311 is going to even expand to give the people who we need to use it, which is the public, more information so that they can fill when they make these calls that they actually know what the outcomes are. Okay. That's a lot, but I think it will help particularly. I have, no, I have particular people in mind who always come to me, not just 125th Street, you know, that, mm -hmm. um, you know, they need to talk about what's happening in the rest of Harlem. So this will be mm -hmm. really good. So we're going to take a little station break here right now. And when we return, we'll talk a little bit more about the work that's being done uh, on 125th Street. You are listening to 125th Street and Beyond 90.3 FM. You are listening to 125th Street and Beyond on 90.3 FM. I am your host, Barbara Askins. We are having a great discussion with Deputy Commissioner Consigner White for New York City Department of Homeless Services. Now let's get a little bit more locally focused. Uh, Cassandra, we talked about uh, earlier at the earlier part of the show about the interagency stuff. And you mm -hmm. talked about some of the... Um, challenges that you faced here. But let's talk about D-O-H, D-O-M-H-M. That's right. Mm -hmm. Why is their work so critical to the work that you you are doing here on 125th Street right now? The work of D-O-H-M-H is absolutely critical because one of the things that we realize at DHS is that when someone becomes homeless, it is usually the last thing that happens on a trajectory um, downhill, right? We often find even when we're dealing with families with children or adults, that oftentimes that is the last resort, right? A person becomes homeless because every other safety net um, is not working or has failed them in some shape, form or fashion. And so what we find specifically uh, with the street homeless population is that a good amount of the population has uh, some sort of trauma, right? That is the reality. A lot of trauma. Um, and so with trauma comes 
the other things that are attributable to trauma, which is substance use disorder and mental illness, right? And so we found that that was just, you know, and this has been historic, but I think it is just more apparent now post COVID, but that is so prevalent, right? And the reality is that DHS, our job is shelter, right? Don't get me wrong. Uh, when you look at our low threshold beds, our safe havens, fully robust mental health services on site, right? So DHS does have mental health shelters. We do have, um, you know, the safe havens that are wraparound programs for people who have serious mental illness and substance use disorder. But the reality is that we know that this population has a lot of prevalence of mental illness, some serious mental illness, and substance use disorder. And so why not go to the city agency that, that are the experts, that have the contracts to do this work, that have the resources, right, who can really be there lockstep with us, right? We can offer you shelter, but if you're in the middle of an episode, right, and you need something in addition to shelter, you may need to go someplace else before you go to shelter or even while you get into shelter, right? And so we wanted to make sure in our outreach efforts that we can meet people where they're at in that moment. Um, and so that's why DOHMH has been uh, instrumental. They can walk people right over to treatment centers in the midst of a conversation, right? They can refer, they have teams that actually go out and do therapy in the field, right? Around mm -hmm. serious mental illness, right? They have teams who can do, provide referrals and, and, and all these other things that, you know, DHS has some of, but most of it is through our contracted outreach providers, not through our rapid response. Um, and then one of the other things we did was come up with the nurses, right? Because what we found with the nurses who are now a big part of our work and who we send regularly to 125th Street is that the nurses brought a different lens to this work. They brought a medical lens to it, but it was mental and physical, which I think also helped us to really address the things that we saw in the street. Because ultimately, if a person is in a, the midst of a substance use disorder episode, uh, they may not respond to what you're saying about the psychiatric situation, but if they have a, a sore on their leg that is oozing with pus, they may respond to you approaching it from a medical perspective to build that rapport, right? And so we've been creative in ensuring that DHS, DOHMH are looking at everything and leaving no stone unturned in terms of who we're looking at to meet people where they're at as we're doing this outreach, because the goal is to get people inside where we can then really begin the work that needs to happen in order to put them on a different trajectory. I can tell you, I am so honored to know you. I am so honored to be working with you. And even during this interview, as much work as we've done together, I'm continuing to learn about the work. And, and what you just said, bring me to the point of the homeless situation is not just on the street, in the streetscape. Mm -hmm. It also enters into the stores and the businesses. Mm -hmm. And and one of the big challenges, because people are always complaining about um, the, the amount and the growing shoplifting and our businesses and most businesses across the street do not want to call the police for shoplifting, you know, inside the stores. And, but we haven't really come up with the, a great way to address this. I call it disturbances in the stores rather than call it shoplifting because some of it is disturbances. But mm -hmm. listening to what you're saying, I think DOHMH would also be helpful with mm -hmm. us with starting to address some of this inside the stores. So we need to get them involved because yeah. the goal for everyone, no one wants to mm -hmm. people to be hurt. They want them to get help. And so that brings us to the question of um, our existing service providers. You know, I provided you with a list of about 25 and I'll be boundaries, which were, you know, just five blocks. So you can see there are many programs from the public yeah. sector, from the private sector, from the community sector. Everyone is trying to address this and coordination is really needed. So. Uh, let's talk about how we're going to, the BID and DHS are going to try to bring um, particularly the people who are working already on 125th Street into this fold of work that we're doing. And it's in your corner here right now. I, I did the easy part, <laughs> putting together the list. <laughs> so so I want to follow your lead on this one. Absolutely. And so what we did, the, the list was great that you gave us. And what I did was I had one of the assistant commissioners under my purview task her team with getting 
direct contact numbers for point people for each of those organizations, right? So we broke the list out because you have um, all types of businesses on there, right? And we want to make sure right. that we parcel out the organizations based on what they cover, right? So with a church service, we put them in one bucket. If it was a uh, provider for shelter, they were in one bucket. If they were a substance use disorder support service, one bucket, right? So we grouped everyone up into buckets based on the work and the services provided under their purview. We then made sure that we identified a point person for each organization because what we envision and working with you on is, uh, Ms. Askins, is that we want to really have everyone be clear about what they can do to help us move the needle. The reality is that everyone has to help out. Everyone has to participate and we all need to be on the same page and everyone on your list can help in some way, shape, form or fashion. But what we do know is if you bring a bunch of people in with different roles and different <laughs> purviews all right. into one meeting and not have clear understanding of what they can actually do, it'll be chaos. So that's why we bucket it out and say, hey, these yeah. folks do this, these folks do this, these folks do this, these folks do that, right? The next step is to get them into meetings with their own respective groups first to really talk about um, the goals that you have, right? What we're looking at, what are the challenges and let them share what they're experiencing, right? Because it has to be collaborative. People, one hand watches the other, right? What they're experiencing, how we can assist them and how they can assist us based on the goals that you have for the 125th Street bid. Once we know that, then I think collectively we can come together with everyone, the people you already have in the room and some of these new folks who are in the room <laughs> partially or not in the room at all and really map out what everyone can do to move us forward, right? Because the reality is that there are so many services and resources in the area and right. everyone has something they can contribute to it or can direct us to someone who can contribute it. And the other piece is the good neighbor policy. One of the first things I said to my team and I reached out to my partners, uh, my other deputy commissioners when DHS has said, the first thing we have to do is make sure that we're looking at our good neighbor policies, right? If there are organizations within the neighborhood that provide services and once we officially be they DHS or DOHMH contracted or not contracted, whatever it is, we all need to have a plan for how we address the things that are coming up, right? We've said to DHS sites, these are the things that we want you to communicate with the folks who are in your shelter, the folks who are in your halfway house, the folks who are getting services here. The same conversation needs to happen at every level with everyone who may have people who are in the neighborhood receiving services or just people who are coming to the neighborhood to purchase stuff, right? Everyone on the same page about the goals of where we're going with this, what the challenges are, what is under everyone's purview and how collectively, if we all share and work together and really be at the table because it can't happen if people are halfway at the table, not at the table. We all have to be at the table, standing up in our truth and doing our piece to move the needle. And so we think bucketing it out, meeting people separately, and then bringing everyone together on one accord is how we move people forward and get the real traction that we want to see happening. Because I think we've done a lot, but there's still much more to do. And I think coordination of services and resources is going to be the way to get there. Well, that and also, too, then after we get that done with with your agencies and the service providers, we have to present it to the interagency task force, all the other agencies. Because one yeah. of the things we find is once they hear your solution, like sanitation will say, oh, I need to be a part of that. We need mm -hmm. to be there because we have what do we do when we find the mentally ill, you know, um, throwing the trash around. You start finding the synergy between the other agencies. And the last part, which we have not done well, and that's what this radio show is about, we have to educate people about it. We have to shout and tell about the story so we can build the synergy and everybody getting involved in it. So, yes. you know, what what would you see some of the benefits to the community for us working closer together? Uh, I see, number one, of 125th Street that is... Um, a pleasure to be there. And it also, too, if there are problems of people needing help, a 125th Street where information is easily accessible for mm -hmm. people to be able to get them that help. That's mm -hmm. what I'm hoping for. So I'm asking you, you know, what are some of the things you would like to see happen from, you know, pulling everybody together? I think the first thing is everyone knowing what everyone has and what the resources are, right? I think one of the things that we have to ensure is that people know what help is available. 
You're absolutely right. People become helpless when they feel like they see someone laying on the ground um, in distress and there's nothing that's going to be done or no one they can call. So people need to know who they can call and know that when they make the call, there's going to be a response um, right. that will that will address the issue to the best of the response's ability. Right. Again, a lot of services are voluntary, but I think the ability to show up and, and demonstrate the willingness to support and move the needle is important. Um, I think in addition to looking at the synergy, I would say when you're talking about coordination of resources, oftentimes it's not really clear what everyone's role is and who could actually do certain things. So I think it's important that when we do get everyone together, that it is pretty clear where we're going, what the goals are, where we want to go, how we're going to get there, and who can do what. Um, because ultimately, if you have people at the table and people are not clear about other people's roles, you then have the silo yeah. when you have the gaps and that, that just doesn't work. So I think the key things is people know what the resources are, what can actually be done, people being informed and empowered to use those resources and then the actual resources standing up and doing their piece, knowing what their roles are, knowing who their partners are and who can help fill in the gaps when things are not going well. I mean, I can tell you in my coordinated behavior health task force, there was a lot of things around um, pieces. People didn't know what part DOH and H was responsible for as opposed to H and H, right? Because a nurse can remove you from the street, but the hospital has to keep you, right? Yeah, That's right. something that man Adams exactly. talks about all the time. We can yes. take you, we can say, hey, you have this gaping wound. When we know the gaping wound is part of the problem, but the substance use disorder and the mental illness is even bigger, Right. So we built the way that when we bring you in, even if it's for a hole in your leg, we're requesting in immediate time, real time, that that hospital, that H and H hospital get you into the psych ward to do the assessment. Right. And the right. other more prevalent things that ultimately you would not have had to get services for if you didn't come in for the leg wound. Right. And so it's pushing the coordination of, serv coordination of services, saying to all of the agencies, you have this resource, you have this resource, you have this resource. And if you bring all those resources together, this is how we can collectively change things and, and move everyone forward. Right, exactly. It's it's great that we, we have figured it out now how to get everybody in the room and make it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So development projects, you know, 125th Street, you hear the stories, they talk about the high vacancies that we have, and we do, there's a, a lot of movement, but vacancies occur for, you know, a lot of different reasons. Some places are vacant, but not available. Some people left, but they still have leases and still paying rent. There are a lot of things, but the development projects, we have uh, development projects which bring scaffolding. Scaffolding is mm -hmm. just such a big problem and it goes right to the heart of, um, you know, the problems that, you know, your agency have to handle. But one of the things my street team, my street team uh, want to know is when, as you said, homeless people are transit and if they leave their belongings there, like we can't leave it on the street, but we feel uncomfortable removing it because then sometimes they come back looking for it. Yeah. Um, how do we handle this kind of situation? I think that is a very difficult situation because sometimes they come back, sometimes they don't. You know, right. oftentimes people are trying to go through the stuff and figure out, are there valuables there? Are they not? Is it trash, right? So I think that's a really difficult position to be in. What we do now when there is an encampment cleanup um, depending on what's found, things are vouchered currently through NYPD. We are moving into a process where DHS will be able to voucher items on our own. We're actually securing a location now. But I would advise your teams to really look at what, what they are finding. If it's trash, that's one thing. But if it's something valuable, I would flag it for the local precinct. Um, the precincts can voucher things. I know it's a little bit difficult to voucher items if you uh, don't have a person attached to it. Um, but I think the reality is that if it's something that you believe to be valuable, you don't want to discard it. And so you do want to find a way to get it to the local precinct or someone who could potentially connect with the individual um, if the person comes back. But ultimately, the reality is that oftentimes folks don't come back or they're transient. And oftentimes you don't even know what's in the items because you have to peel back the items to see what it is. And for us, that is primarily something that sanitation does if um, the person uh -huh. is not there. Sanitation okay. will go in and peel back 
as he was in there, DHS will be there on the side, offering the services, but sanitation does a lot of that. And NYPD currently vouchers, but in the near future, DHS will be able to voucher uh, items for individuals as well. The key thing, though, is that individuals who get their items vouchered are individuals who are moving along, right? So we don't expect them to go back to that location or individuals who are going into shelter. But I think you can speak to your local precinct and sanitation, or we could bring that to the collective group <laughs> to figure out what right. they recommend, right? right? In terms of when we don't really know what's going to happen with the person. They're not going to shelter. We don't have an ID card, uh, but we believe this is something that's valuable enough that we don't want to discard it. This is a conversation for our partners. Is it NYPD that vouchers it? Is it sanitation, like who, who, where can these things go just in case a person comes back? But if it's trash or something blocking ingress or egress, the reality is that it needs to be cleaned up. So it's, it's a little struggle for us. We, we do it case by case basis. Yep. And that is something, particularly since we have all of those, um, you know, scaffolding there with the new development. So let's mm -hmm. talk about a little bit, because the name of this program is 125th Street and Beyond. And so when you first started your work, people start um, moving away from 125th Street, mm -hmm. um, down Lenox Avenue, more over to the park. And and as you say, they're transit, they're coming from the east side and, and everywhere. So what about other areas in Harlem? Are they as challenging as 125th Street? Is it easier? Are, are there more homeless there? Just give us, a, um, you know, just the landscape of what's happening with this situation for the rest of Harlem, particularly for our listeners. I think the, that all over New York City, they have these challenges. I think there are other challenging areas in Harlem. I do know that we have seen great success on 125th. And it's interesting because I had received an, a call a couple of weeks ago where folks are asking how we could duplicate <laughs> what's happening at 125th <laughs> Street, right? Um, because I think we've seen great success. But I absolutely believe that um, we're seeing these challenges all over New York and all over the country. The great thing about New York is that we have an administration that is committed, right? You're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars committed to doing this work, which gives us um, a bandwidth that other folks don't have. Um, and so while I think people on 125th Street may feel like, oh, there's a lot happening here. I think the good thing is that we're all here. We know what's happening. We're committed to, to fixing it and we're bringing the resources. We've just started, only, it's only been a year, a little over a year, right? But I think that yes. this work, requires that we keep at it, right? It is not an easy uh, fix, but I think when you see the rewards of the, the area just being more comfortable, the quality of life being more comfortable and people being connected to services. I've seen people's lives saved, right? We take people to a doctor and the doctor says, if this person didn't come in today, they wouldn't have made it through the night, right? So the ability to save lives and connect vulnerable people to services, meanwhile, improving and ensuring the quality of life I think 120 Fish is already on the way to that. I think these challenges are everywhere, but we're going to keep keep it on and keep going. And I think we're going to see even bigger stuff when we bring the rest of the folks to the table. Absolutely. So we have a lot to be proud of and a lot more that we're going to do to be proud of. So I want to give you the final words. Any final words? I'll throw out some topics that you can touch if you want, and you don't have to touch them. I know that you're working with the uh, controversial type uh, situation and trying to find solutions, but um, legislation, legislation that helps, legislation that is hindering people who receive services, you know, how can we get a show van back on 125th Street? Or you can say anything that you want. I'm giving you the last, uh, you got about three minutes that you can give your pitch for what you want to achieve and also to what you want your listeners to know more about the work that you're doing. So I will say legislation is a, a big one. Um, and I think that this administration, under Mayor Adams, Deputy Mayor Isom, has done a tremendous amount of work around uh, changing and advocating for legislation that allows us to do the work that needs to be done. Uh, there's a lot of legislation that they've gone to uh, the state to deal with around how we provide mental health services, right? What happens when people go to the hospital? How do we treat serious mental illness? Um, Deputy Mayor Isom has a gentleman on her team that I work very closely with who has been lockstep in advocating, drafting, and working with the legal teams 
to make sure that we are not only attacking this on the ground, but also making sure that the laws that are on the books support the work and support us in moving the needle. So I think the legislative work is absolutely happening through City Hall and the partnership through the state and the city has been amazing. I can tell you that has been an added bonus that we've never seen before. And I think that that has changed things. I think one of the important things is that this work, homelessness work, especially street homelessness work, it is such a glaring um, situation, right? That I think that people oftentimes just don't know all that goes into it, all of the work I say to my staff all the time. I know that this can be thankless work, but it's also some of the most important work. I, I never imagined I would be doing street homelessness after spending 15 years with families with children, homelessness. But I can tell you this has been the most rewarding because I think there's nothing like the feeling when you know that you have gone into an area and brought everyone together to look at a situation and to change things for the better, right? And me being a Harlemite, so I, I, I can live anywhere in the world. When they say where you're from, I'm going to say Harlem, right? So that is the reality <laughs> of it. So, you know, to see the things we've done and to know that there's going to be so much more being done for some place that is near and dear to me, I think is important. Um, and so I'm excited about the work that we're doing. Sometimes this work can be thankless, uh, but I think we have an administration that supports us and we have amazing partners like you, Ms. Askin, who say to us, this is what we need you to do. <laughs> and <laughs> how do I help you do it? And how do you, you know, how do we work together to improve lives, right? And 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 make sure that the Harlem that I grew up with, 125th Street was an amazing place growing up, right? I would be there regularly, walking up and down as a child, right? When they closed County Cullen, I went to the library on 125th Street and think Lexus Nav. So I'm used to navigating and we want people to feel like the same way I felt in the 80s, right? In the 90s, walking around comfortable. That is the way we want people to continuously feel about Harlem with all of its riches and, and all of the wonderful people who are there. So I think we just need to roll up our sleeves and continue on this trajectory because I think that we've done a lot uh, and we have a supportive administration we've never had before in terms of financial resources. And I think it can only go up from here. So I'm excited about this work and I'm especially appreciative of the opportunity you've given us to work with you. Um, Deputy Mayor Isom, who is amazing, a leader and her team. I just think that we, we're going to only do great things and I'm excited about Harlem. I always will be. Um, and I'm excited about this partnership with you, Ms. Askins. Thank you so much, Cassandra. And thank you listeners for listening to 125th Street and beyond. I'm Barbara Askins. Board operator is Angela Harding. My guest today is Deputy Commissioner at the City of New York of Homeless Services, Cassandra White. So Cassandra, thank you so much for taking time <laughs> out of your busy schedule to share with our listeners the important work that you are doing. Tune in next Monday at 4 p.m. on 90.3 FM for 125th Street and beyond. You can reach me, Barbara Askins, at BID125THST at AOL.com. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>